Dressed up for the class? Didn't dress up for the class, I hope. Uh, just <laughs> Okay, folks, welcome. Before I get started, uh, I noticed uh, quite a few familiar faces. How many of you were in my corporate finance class last year? Last, last spring. It was a year ago. Last spring. No? That's it? Oh, huh. interesting. But what happened to all those people in the corporate finance class? They disappeared? Yeah. Um, how many of you are not Stern MBAs? Are you getting my emails? Yes. Okay, good. Because I, if you're not a Stern MBA and you have a nyu.edu address, Stern sometimes has trouble with you. How many of you are second year MBAs graduating after this semester? Okay. How many of you take my corporate finance class this semester with me? So I'll see you twice every Monday and Wednesday. You're going to get sick and tired of me. Right? <laughs> because you're going to get emails from that class and this class. You better have a way of organizing the two. Otherwise, you're going to get really confused about what's happening when. So, you know, you know. so already you've got the corporate finance email. There's another one coming in valuation. But as you go through the semester, you'll lose track of which. Right? Also, if you're asking me a question, clarify which class. It's related to because I have no idea where you you know what where it's coming from. So this is obviously a valuation class, and I will tell you a story to kind of give you a history for this class. I came to NYU in 1986, fall of 1986. I was hired as an assistant professor. I was given a class to teach. 
It is a class called security analysis. You guys heard of this class? It was actually a class that became famous in the 1950s at Columbia University, taught by a guy called Ben Graham. Heard of him? If you haven't heard of him, you probably heard of his most famous student. Warren Buffett went through his class. So it's a class which was legendary. They handed over to me and I take one look at the class and I say, look, I don't want to teach this class. It's the most boring class ever. Because by 1986, it was showing its age. It was four weeks on stocks and three weeks on bonds and a week on futures, a week on options and five weeks on institutional detail. Like what? There was an entire session on listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange. Teaching was so easy in the days before Wikipedia. You could actually get in front of a class and start going through, and everybody took everything down. Today, if you tried that, people would be checking Wikipedia. While you did that, said, why would we need a class? So I went to the head of my department, and I said, I don't want to teach this class. He should have fired me on the spot. He's a nice guy. He said, what would you like to teach instead? I said, I'd like to teach a valuation class. Nobody was doing it anywhere in the country, but I wanted to do it. He said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. And you know what? He was absolutely right. There wasn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. There were no books on valuation. He said, what about security analysis written by Ben Graham? Does anybody know which year the first edition of security analysis was published? Just even if you don't know, guess, what do you, what do you think? 1934. You know what the world felt like in 1934? You were still in the, the throes of the Great Depression. If you read the security analysis book, and very few people who claim to have read the book actually have read that book. It's an incredibly dense book. What you will see is a book rooted in avoiding risk. And the way I describe Ben Graham's security analysis, it's about treating a stock as a bond with price appreciation. In other words, the dividends acted like coupons and you got a little price appreciation, but you avoided risk. But don't take issue with them because he wrote the book in 1934. That's exactly what the world looked like from a risk-taking perspective. Nobody wanted to take risk. The point is 1934 security analysis, you know, you value a bond, a stock like a bond, you want dividends, you want them now, you want cash flows, who cares about growth, right? And NVIDIA would never be worth any money in a Ben Graham security, not because he had no vision, but it came from a very different perspective. That was the only book around. There was really no work done on valuation. It was considered too practical for academics but I really, really wanted to teach this class. And I discovered very early in my academic life that if you want to get anything done at a university, and take this as advice, if you're trying to get anything done at NYU, the best way to do it is to do it subversively. Don't ask for permission. Because if you ask for permission, you know what will happen, right? A committee will be formed. You guys have experience with committees? They meet and they meet and they meet. They forget what they're meeting about and they're baby committees that they call subcommittees. And it's very incestuous. They report to each other. Nobody any, has any idea what they're meeting about. And 40 years later, they'd come back to me and say, you can teach the class, but I'd be too old to do it. So I told the head of the department, I teach a security analysis class. I walked in, shut the door. Remember it was downtown. You know, the graduate business school was downtown then. There were no cameras in the classroom. I shut the door and they have no idea what happens inside the room. I could be teaching cooking for 15 weeks <laughs> and nobody would complain if you gave them all A's. And I taught my first valuation class. You know how long it took them to catch on? In 2008, I get a call from the Dean's office. So we're here teaching a valuation class. I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. <laughs> They said, we don't see it listed anywhere in the course schedule. I said, that's very easy to explain. I've been hijacking all these other classes you've been giving me and teaching valuation. Instead, for a dozen years, I taught this class called Equity Instruments and Markets. I'll make a confession. I am not that interested in markets. I don't much care for instruments. And even equity, I don't feel an attachment to. You take equity instruments, markets out of it. All you're left with is ant. I taught valuation instead. 
scientists that have been hijacking this class and teaching valuation instead. They said, that's not right. You should call it valuation. I said, I agree. <laughs> so if you look at course listings at NYU, valuation shows up for the first time in the fall of 2008. This might be spurious correlation, but that's when the world went into crisis. So maybe we should have just left it at equity instruments and markets. Maybe this class is responsible for the entire world coming apart. This semester I'm teaching this class. And then, then at 3.30, I'll go teach the undergraduates exactly the same class. And it'll be my 59th and 60th semester teaching this class. And I'm gonna say something about this class that's gonna encapsulate how I think about valuation. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Let me explain. I started my first valuation class was in 1986. One year into the class, 1987, fall of 87, we were still downtown at that time. The Graduate Business School was right next to the American Stock Exchange. I finished teaching my, my, my valuation class. I come to my office. I look out of my window and I see that everybody from the American Stock Exchange is out on the street. All the traders are out. So what happened? Fire alarm went off. It was October 19th of 1987. Does anybody remember what happened on October 19th of 1987? It was a Monday. That yeah. doesn't have to be said. Mondays, bad things happen. I don't know why. Black Monday. There are so many Black Mondays, though. What made this Black Monday so black? The S&P drop, guess how much? 22% in one day. Think of what that would look like in today's world, right? A 22% drop in the S&P 500 would be like an 800 point drop in the S&P 500. It would be like a 10,000 point drop in the Dow. We'd freak out, right? You'd wonder whether you'd have your jobs at the end of the semester. And people were freaked out. That was a Monday. Wednesday, I come back in front of my evaluation class and guess what the first question I'm asked is? We're talking about valuation. How with your valuation tools can you explain the entire market dropping by 22% in one day? I mean, you can explain one company dropping, right? Bad things happen. PayPal set expectations too high. Tesla must did something crazy. But the entire market dropping, you wiped out trillions of dollars in market cap essentially overnight. I would be lying if I said I knew the answer, but I, I'm incapable, and my kids tell me this, of saying the words, I don't know. So I try. I try to talk about what it is with an evaluation metric that can explain why markets might drop by 10, 15, 20% one day. And I started thinking about market, market crises that day. And the way I think about market crises now is born in that moment. So when you go and look at my discussions of the 2020 COVID crisis, the 2008 bank, you can see the seeds of that class, but it started in that class, not by reading a paper, not by listening to a talk, but by a question asked in class. Let's move forward into the 1990s. In the 1990s, you saw a phenomenon in public markets we'd never seen before. Companies with small revenues, no clear business model, and big losses going public. These companies had always been around, but prior to the 1990s, where did they get the capital? I mean, comp young companies have always been around, but they got their capital from venture, venture capitalists. 1990s, they jumped the queue, went directly to markets. Of course, I'm talking about the dot-com boom. I still remember the day again in 1997, a student of the class says, and we value this company called Amazon.com. They said, stupidly, I said, yes, I don't see why not. At that time, they were an online book retailer. Not even an online retailer, online book retailer. And during the course of that class, I valued Amazon.com. And here's what I discovered. Almost every input I needed for that valuation, there was nothing in the literature about how to estimate cash flows and discount rates and growth rates and risks. 
for a very young company. We were so used to history-based forecasts. You know what I talk about? Take 10 years of income statements, project things out. So everything was like pulling teeth. And I kept a journal of how many roadblocks I ran into in valuing Amazon in 1997. And the journal, by the time I was done valuing the company, was 75 pages long, because of how many roadblocks I ran into. I never throw away anything I write. So I slapped a title on that on that 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 journal, 75 pages. I called it the dark side of valuation. Can Amazon.com be valued? Because what I heard from people is don't even try. You can't value companies like that. I still hear that with young companies. You cannot value companies like that. That became one of my books. It's in, it's in its third edition called The Dark Side of Valuation. It's now about valuing any company where you feel uncomfortable. But that day was when I started thinking about how do you value young companies? And if you look at my valuation of Airbnb from 2019 or Zomato in 2021, you'll see the seeds of my, of my Amazon valuation play through because that's the playbook I had to develop because somebody said, can you value a company called Amazon.com? Incidentally, Amazon is one of those companies I valued every year for the last 26. So somewhere along the course of this class, we'll talk about how valuations evolve over time. Move forward about 10 years. It's 2008, we're in the middle of, middle of a market crisis. A market crisis caused by banks behaving badly. Here again, question comes up. What, well, no, companies behave badly all the time, but usually the pain is felt primarily by that company. But when banks behave badly, we all feel the pain. It's called systemic risk. Since 2008, it's become this big area to examine. So again, somebody in class says, why when banks behave badly, do the rest of us feel, feel the pain? So again, we had to talk about how when companies behave badly, the side effects can affect the values of all of the companies around them, at least for some companies. And then you get to the last decade. And you get the decade of what I call the numbers company. Let me explain. Yeah? Take some of the biggest IPOs of the last decade. Facebook, 2012 IPO. What's the most impressive number about Facebook? Is it its revenues? No, there are lots of companies. 10 times its revenues. It's not the margins. Could be the data, but you have no idea what the data is. It's the number of people in its ecosystem. You know how many people are in the Facebook ecosystem? Remember, Facebook includes Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram. Collectively, those ecosystems have two and a half to three billion people. It's kind of a scary thought. One out of every two adults on the face of the earth is on a Facebook ecosystem. You think, so what? 2017, I remember the class again. I'd valued Uber in my class as I had starting in 2013 every year. Somebody in class said, that's a valuation of Uber, but can you value an Uber rider? You see what the question is, right? Can you value what the value of a rider is? I said, let's start simpler. Let's value a Netflix subscriber. And you'll see why in a moment, a Netflix subscriber is easier to value than an Uber rider. If I asked you what the value of a subscriber is to Netflix, Explain to me how using the tools of valuation you'd come up with the value of a subscriber to Netflix. Anybody want to give that a shot? Richard, you're Netflix. I'm a subscriber. How do you make money off it? You have Netflix? I do not. Okay, then I'll pick somebody who does it. Do you have Netflix? Okay. You hear me? As in, you be the subscriber, I'm Netflix. How do I make money off you? In fact, you don't even notice you pay. There's this auto payment every month. You get this little Netflix charge. You don't even notice the amount. It's a very great, it's an amazing system. It could be $222 a month and you have no idea because it just sends you a message. But every month I collect subscriptions. So to value a Netflix subscriber, let's work this out. As Netflix, I had to estimate how much I collect in subscription revenues. What else do I have to estimate? How long you would stay on as a subscriber, right? What's that driven by? It's driven by what's called churn rates, how quickly 
So if my if Netflix's churn rate is about ninety is about four percent, basically ninety six percent renewal. So let's say your expected life as a Netflix subscriber is ten years. So we're almost there. What do I do? I take the next the expected subscription revenues over the next ten years. There's probably some expense associated with servicing individual subscribers. I'm not talking about the content cost because for Netflix, the content cost is a fixed cost. They don't say, well, you know, she signed up Stranger Things, we'll add another actor on, you know, we've got a new subscriber. The cost is the cost. So I take the present value of the subscription revenues, net of those servicing costs, I've got the value of the subscriber to Netflix. And I did this in 2019, it was about $500 per subscriber. But that's if you're a US subscriber. If you're an Indian subscriber, you still have to pay subscriptions, but you know what the average monthly subscription is in India? It's about one quarter, the subscription. In fact, there's a version of Netflix in India where you can watch only on your smartphone. And the reason it sells are a lot of Indians whose only device is their smartphone, thanks to Reliance Geo, which should collect a premium of every company that lives off this. A typical Indian subscriber, and this is something that I always wonder about because Netflix in its and when, when it reports, uh, has an earnings call, talks about how many subscribers that. I keep waiting for the day where one of the analysts asks the question, right? So when you tell me I had 1 million more subscribers, given what we just said about a US versus Indian subscriber, what's the question you should be asking the Netflix here for? Um, where did yeah. those subscribers come from, right? I have never heard analysts ask that question which tells you that people don't think about what the value of a subscriber is, just a number of subscribers. So valuing a Netflix subscriber is easy in a value. Valuing an Uber rider is more difficult. Let's do a survey. How many of you are Uber, can't be a subscriber. You have Uber on your phone, right? Now I could go around and ask you how much you use Uber, but even without knowing the answer to the question, you can already see some people don't use much Uber. Some people, like my youngest son, I think uses Uber to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, he has like six Uber charges. I, I keep, use my credit card still because I want to know where he is on a Saturday night. That's more important to me than the money I'm spending. Six Uber charges between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. I say, Kieran, what are you doing? Maybe the Uber driver comes into his apartment, carries him to the bathroom. Not a bad service to offer, young, you know. If you're too drunk, the Uber driver will come in and carry on with $8 charge. But the problem is you can have people who use hardly any Uber and people who use Uber $300 a month. So for an Uber rider, I had to look at the average, right? And you say, how are you going to get that? We see the gross billings, Uber reports that. They also tell you how many riders they have. So I value an Uber rider. I did that because somebody asked the question. In fact, I'm glad I spent time doing that because the approach I used, I then used to value Spotify when it went public, any subscription-based company. Which brings me to 2020. March 6th of 2020, I was teaching this class down in Paulson. We all get emails at the same time from NYU. You know what the email said, right? There's a virus going around. Next week is spring break. Go home a week early. We'll be back in three weeks. Complete lie. So I live in San Diego. I took off. I went home. I didn't come back for a year and a half. Why? Because we basically stayed. But between March and April, the entire global economy shut down. It's not that long ago. Remember that? We're all stuck in our houses. And I was still teaching the class on Zoom. And March 23rd, I decide I want to value Boeing. Think about it. You're in the middle of a shutdown. There are no planes flying. And you're valuing a company in the heart of the storm, right? It makes aircraft that nobody... But one choice is, why don't you wait for the crisis to pass? This is often the response here. Because if you do this, you'll just roll from crisis to crisis. You'll never get anything done. And what's the point of waiting? You have to invest in, in Boeing today. That's a choice you have to make. So March 23rd, at the peak of that mar market crisis, the S&P lost 36% between February 14th and March 20th of 2020. Six weeks. 
on March 23rd, the, at peak hysteria, I actually valued Boeing in class. I recorded it, it's on YouTube now. It's basically about valuing companies essentially when the world is melting down around you, when the economy is shut down. The point I'm making is, Whenever I think about things I do differently in valuation now, they have their roots in somebody saying, can we value that? Maybe during the course of the semester, you're gonna ask me a question to which I don't know the answer. I'm not gonna say I don't know the answer, but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna try. How much value has Lionel Messi added to Apple? See, what's Lionel Messi got to do with Apple? You know, Apple has the exclusive rights to major league soccer in the US. You didn't even know there was Major League Soccer. That's a problem for Major League Soccer because even soccer fans will watch the Premier League but not Major League Soccer. When Lionel Messi signed up for Miami, the number of people, and it's a subscription. It's like $7.99 and you can pay it on an annual basis. The number of MLS subscriptions doubled after Messi joined. You saying when he leaves, they will leave? Maybe they will, but that could, a, a chunk of that could be long term. Can we value it? Yes, we'll have to make some estimates. But here's a trickier one: How much value does Taylor Swift add to the NFL? <laughs> and I'm not being facetious because she's brought in people who watch NFL games who never watched NFL games before. I mean, the NFL's weakest link has always been attracting young women to watch the game, and now you're getting 18, 20, 25 years. I mean, if I, uh, Taylor Swift is an incredibly shrewd woman. I mean, she remember, she actually also you know, recorded a concert, was the biggest, one of the biggest hits. And if she can work this out, uh, you know, she should go to the NFL and say, I'd like about 5% of his Super Bowl revenues because... Now, who knows how much higher their advertising rates are going to be because my point is everything which has cash flows has a value and there are questions and almost every question you see out there. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. And this is something you're going to notice with every single class through the semester. I'm going to start the class with a quiz. Not about the previous class, but about what's coming. See, that's stupid. You're quizzing us and then talking about it? Because what I want to bring home is almost everything we talk about during the course of the class, you could have figured out yourself. And I'm gonna give you a mechanism that lets you think about it in a more structured way. Nothing in this class should be mind blowing. And perhaps the quizzes will give you an opening to see that. So here, today's quiz is gonna be very low tech. It's about why you're taking this class and what do you think this class is about? So I want some honest answers here. Why are you here? Maybe I should list it's an easy A, that's as a starting point. It's not, but you know, maybe that's why you're here. Yeah. Is it because you think taking this class will make you richer? How many of you are thinking this is, come on, you can be honest. Thank you. It's not gonna make you richer. At least in your class. And it'd be false advertising to say, if I gave you the valuation tools, you're going to get rich. You know how much money is being wasted around the world now because people are offering, if you take this, you'll be rich. And I'll explain why that connection between learning valuation and getting rich is not just not linear. It might not even be. It might be wavy lines that lead to the wrong place. And maybe you were something else in your previous lab and now you think learning valuation will allow you to become an investment banker, a private equity person. Maybe it's job driven, right? There are valuation jobs. In learning. And that's, you know, maybe it's to impress. It's always impressive. You say, I'll tell you how much Taylor Swift is adding to the NFL and you give them a number. 38.5 million. Now, people have no idea what he said, but they're too intimidated to ask you any more questions. Right? <laughs> and Maybe, and this is, I think, perhaps the reason that makes the most sense to me. It's to give you the tools to understand when you're fooling yourself. Let's face it, the biggest enemy you have as an investor looks at you when you look in the mirror. It's you. 
maybe this class will give you a sense of, hey, you know, when am I making assumptions, doing things that are led by my, it's not, it's not, it's not the company that's doing it, it's because I want to buy this company. So file that away, as I said, not to, towards the end of the class, I'll ask you whether I delivered and whatever your objective is. Here's the second question. I'm often asked, is valuation an art or a science? So give me a price and I'll give you the choices. Valuation is a science, valuation is an art, valuation is magic. It's what Ernst and Young would like you to believe, saying you can't do it without it's magical. You can put five person, people in a room and they do magical things. Or maybe it's none of the above. Maybe you have your own characterization of what valuation is. So again, I'm not prejudging what your answer is. Make a choice. And finally, I'm going to ask you a question about yourself. Each of us has a stronger side. The legend of the left brain and the right brain, it's been, there's no such thing, but let's stay with that legend, right? Left brain controls rational emotion, right brain, or what the, the reverse might be true. One half of your brain is rational, the other half of your brain is storytelling. I want you to look inward and think about what you're more comfortable with. Is it working with numbers? Or is it telling stories? As I said, no right answer. This is about you. Saying, how would I know? You've known for a very long time. You knew in sixth grade. I knew when I was 12 or 13 what I was. And it happened after my first English literature class. <laughs> I was asked to read Moby Dick. And I did. I was a good kid. Came in next, the next day ready for a discussion of whales and captives and harpoons. And I noticed 20 minutes in, nobody was talking about the whale. So I put up my hand and I said, when are we going to talk about the whale? And I remember the instructor saying, there is no whale. He said, what did I read the wrong book? I distinctly remember a big fish running all the way through the book. She said, it's a metaphor. And my jaw dropped. And the rest of the class was about hidden meanings in the book that didn't even know had a meaning in the first place. I remember coming out of the class with a singular conclusion. I said, never again am I going to subject myself to this kind of bullshit. <laughs> and my high school life was laid out for me. I avoided the literature classes like the, like the plague. It was Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Algebra 3 out of high school. And these were the good old days. You know what college looked like in the good old days? There was no core curriculum. You know the core curriculum is, right? They make you waste the first two years of your life taking things you don't want to take because they lie to you until you get a rounded education. It's a complete lie. You know why they make you take history? Because without you required to take history, there would be no history department. <laughs> Those days, you, were, you could take a... What, you, know, you could basically jump in. If you were a numbers person, you got a quant degree in what accounting, engineering, mathematics, science, and you got a quant job. And who do you hang out with? Other quant people. And you never notice you were all strange people because you just talk to each other. It's like watching software engineers talk to each other. They have no idea how, how odd they are. <laughs> Right. Staying up until three o'clock in the morning and working on software is not normal, but if that's all you hang out with. It's what numbers people do. At the same time, there were people who came out of that Moby Dick class saying, this is amazing, hidden meanings and everything. They're the poets. My youngest son writes poetry. He showed me his first poem. I don't think he's going to show me anymore. <laughs> He said, Dad, what do you think? And I said, Kiran, aren't the last words supposed to rhyme? My vision of poetry is like nursery rhymes. I got stuck in, you know, when I was sick. He said, Dad, you'll never be a poet. And I said, you're right. They take literature one, literature two, literature three, and then they go on to college and they do a story degree, history major from Yale. And then they graduate. And then they discover that even Yale history majors don't make much money. It's an unpleasant truth, right? Because you're, you know, and after about three years of poverty stricken wages, you say, I'm tired of this. And you quit and you're back here, right? 
<laughs> I mean, let's face it. Now, lots of you from liberal arts majors are story people. You tried the story job. You might have enjoyed the job, but at some point it does. You got to make a living. I'm going to ask a question. And as I said, go with your gut. How many of you are more naturally numbers people? Okay. How many of you are more naturally story people? The numbers people outnumber the story people, but not that much. It's about two thirds and one third. Who do you think is going to have an easier time with this class? You think the numbers? Usually you think numbers people, because what do you do? When you think valuation, what do you think? You think Excel spreadsheet and numbers? Right. Hold on for just a while, because I'm going to talk about what you need in valuation. And you're going to be surprised at what you find. Especially if you're a story person, hold on. Don't give up hope yet. They might have an advantage on the third decimal point, but you have an advantage on something substantially more important in valuation. So let's put this away and open up your syllabus because this is the logistics right there. You know, there are three buildings in the school. It's, this is how NYU works. The business school is actually wedged between an old building that was called Tish Hall and another old building called Shimkin. On any given moment, I couldn't tell you which building I was in. You notice with the elevators, you take the elevator, you take the wrong one, you end up on the wrong floor, you spend a half a day trying to find the right floor. Good luck. I think it's by design. My office is in KMEC 969, which is, I think, this building. But if you walk across that corridor, it becomes the other building. So, you know, so you take the elevators in this building, whatever those elevators are. Okay. My email address is probably the quickest way you'll get a response. You know, because I do check my emails frequently. My homepage we'll talk about because a lot of the stuff for this class is there and it'll give you access to the resources. My office hours are just before this class. Mm -hmm. I will create a Zoom link for the office hours in case you cannot physically be. I'd rather that you came into my office. I'm a little tired of Zoom office hours, but if you can make it only on Zoom, I'll have Zoom running on the side. The teaching assistants are Ken and Alan, both of whom took this class last year, so they're completely aware of everything in this class. They're good resources. They will be, they, are, they, they probably haven't emailed you yet, but sometime this week, they will email you with office hours and the timing for a review session every week where you basically take what we do in class and apply it from problems from past quizzes. So let's start with that first question. I'm going to spend the bulk of the rest of this class on laying out the themes of the class. And I'm going to argue that the next 45 minutes are perhaps the most critical component of this class. Because after that, we'll talk about details and specifics, but this lays the philosophical foundations for how I think about valuation. Let's go back to the first question. Is valuation a science or not? Let's take the first one, science. Is mathematics a science? It's the only pure science. In fact, mathematicians are convinced that the rest of us are imposters. Okay. Think about what, what it is about mathematics that makes it a science. Pantarav, can you hazard a guess? What is it that makes mathematics a science? It's the fact that it has a definitive, definitive Oh, I can give you finance models that have definitive answers, but the problem is they're definitively wrong, right? Because in finance, you can come up with definite. It's not just that it's definitive, but it is absolute. It's either right or wrong. You get the inputs right, you get the output right. Physics is mostly a science. If we all manage to get to the 11th floor, get one of those windows, I think they're kind of sealed shut, but open and jumped out. We don't fall in the order of our IQs or where we are in the organizational structure. The laws of gravity are the laws of gravity. You can't argue with them. Physics is mostly a science. But the essence of a science, you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Can valuation ever be a science? Zero chance of being a science. In fact, 
one of the things that I'll talk about this more that I'm going to send you every week, the valuation of the week. What is it? I'm going to value a company. What company? A company I want to value. This is all about me. Right? So tomorrow I'm going to send you my valuation of Tesla. Why? Because Tesla fascinates me. And I did my best. I took the information on Tesla. I made my best judgments. I came up with the value of this. I did this originally in, in November, and I came up with the value 180. Now with some adjustments, it's you know, because the risk-free rate has gone down, the risk premium has shrunk. It's around 192. But if you ask me, are you certain? My response is, are you out of your mind? How can you be certain about the value of a company like Tesla? Because so many things are going to change. I can get every single input right and my output is going to be wrong 100% of the time. And I'm okay with that. Why? Because I know valuation is not a science. Is valuation an art then? Is painting an art? Not painting your house, you know the painting I'm talking about. Like the Mona Lisa that somebody threw soup at you. I remember taking my youngest, uh, my oldest son, when he was eight years old, to the Met for a Picasso exhibit. And eight year olds in museums don't mix well. So, with substantial bribery, I think I had to get him two baseball cards and a couple of hot dogs. He lasted 30 minutes. In a Picasso exhibit, I come out and I say, Ryan, what did you think of that exhibit? He said, Dad, I was not impressed. He said, that was a Picasso exhibit. He said, Dad, that guy can't get the nose in the right place. Have you noticed it about Picasso? The nose comes out of the side of the head, the top of the head, the back of the head, or no nose at all. Almost like he was drugged or drunk, which in Picasso's case might be both. But we've all gathered together and said, Picasso is so special. It's worth 130 million. The essence of an art is you really cannot teach it. I know you've seen paint by the numbers. You know, you can make something that looks like a Picasso by painting by the numbers. But I guarantee you, your painting is not going to be worth $130 million or even a dollar thirty. It looks like a Picasso, but it's not a Picasso. The essence of an art is you cannot teach it. I hope valuation is not an art or I've wasted 40 years of my life trying to teach something that cannot be taught. So you think if it's not a science and it's not an art, what is it? It's a craft. I'll give you the discipline that I think is closest to valuation. It's cooking. How do you get better at cooking? You could watch the Food Network, right? You could watch chopped episode after chopped episode and beat Bobby Flay after beat Bobby Flay. At the end of two weeks, if I ask you to cook something, good luck with that. You don't learn cooking by watching TV. You don't learn cooking by reading cookbooks. You learn cooking by cooking. You got to go to that room in your apartment called the kitchen. I know you've been avoiding it for a while because you had takeout for so long. And the first time you cook, what happens? <clears throat> Disaster. I still remember the first time I scrambled eggs. Nobody told me I was supposed to spray the damn pan. I scrambled the eggs. They look great, but they won't come off the pan. Pan and eggs go in the trash. I learned a very important lesson about scrambling eggs. Spray the damn pan. Or I tried to make something where they said, whip the egg in till it has a top. I whipped and I whipped and I whipped and it just stayed an egg. And my wife came home and she said, let me show you how to do it. Whips it and it was... It actually stands up. It's, it's kind of eerie, the white alone. I'll have to do a lot more practicing. You learn cooking by cooking. And the more you cook, the better you get. You learn valuation by doing. Which means this is really bad news, but take it for what it's worth. These 26 sessions with me are kind of useless. All the books you will read won't help you that much. You will learn valuation by valuing companies. You know why I do this valuation of the week? Because I want you to not just try your hand at valuation, but I want you to try your hand at valuing very different companies. So this week, it'll be Tesla. Next week, I might put out Birkenstock, about as different from Tesla as you can get. The week after, I might go to Turkey and give you an, a construction company in Turkey. I will value the company. I will do the dirty work. 
And your initial response is, but I don't feel comfortable doing this yet. I'm just starting the class. Change what you feel comfortable changing. And I'll make a prediction. When I do this valuation of the week, I create a Google shared spreadsheet where you can try your hand. I create the, the infrastructure, the spreadsheet. You can change the inputs and come up with the value. And in the Google shared spreadsheet, you can see the values that everybody trying this company. So it's the 130 people in this class, plus the 350 people in my undergraduate class. Plus I keep the spreadsheet open in case people from outside want to join in as well. So you, know, you get 500, 600. It's like a crowd valuation of the company. Now, early on, as I said, you feel, you say, I don't know enough. You change the third decimal on the risk-free rate, come up with a value very close to mine, and say, I got value exactly like yours. You know when I know this class is working? It's somewhere around the fifth or the sixth week, I'm going to value a company. And you're going to come back to me and say, I got a very different value. Expecting me to push back. And I'm going to say, congratulations, the class is working. So you don't have to do So let me be clear, there's no credit for this. You don't have, in fact, this class is a little bit like drinking out of a hose, right? There's tons coming at you. You have to pick and choose what you have the time to do. I think that you will learn my, more by doing the valuations of the week than you will by reading another 50 pages in my valuation book. But you pick and choose where you want to spend your time because I understand you have only a certain amount of time for this class. But that's the essence of a craft is you learn by doing. And the more diverse your companies, the more you will learn. Second big theme for this class. There are two words in investing markets appraisal that I People use interchangeably. And I blame both academia and practitioners for this. And the words are price and value. You know why academia does it, right? Because finance as we know it was born out of efficient markets in the 1960s. In an efficient market, price and value are interchangeable. I'm going to draw a distinction here. I'm going to be a bit of a bit finicky about this all through the class. You're going to say, I valued something. I'm going to, say, I'm going to stop you and say, did you value it or did you price it? So let me draw the contrast. We know what drives the value of a company. We've known for a long time. It's cash flows, growth, and risk. You can dance around this as much as you want. We didn't invent this 100 years ago. The Venetian glassmaker in the 1400s who sold his business based on cash flows, growth, and risk. Value is driven by cash flows, growth, and risk. In the last century, we've built an infrastructure that we've attached an acronym to, DCF. But a discounted cash flow valuation is not a, a theory. It's just a way of bringing cash flows, growth, and risk into one valuation. So that's where right. cash flows, growth, and risk. And we try to. You see, what drives price? It's demand and supply. You see, but aren't demand and supply, supply driven by cash flows, growth, and risk? They might be, but they're also driven by mood and momentum and revenge. Think revenge. My undergraduate class, I put a valuation of GameStop that I did in 2021. Remember that sorry episode? First, does anybody I actually had to send them a little YouTube video of what a GameStop mall store looked like? Because many of them are too young to actually have gone into a game. You've been in a GameStop store, right? At some point in your life, especially when you were a teenager. Store would have all these games, you'd go in and play and you'd buy one of those games. It's a, it's a Brick and mortar mall game store where you actually bought games as videos or as you know on, on discs. You think that business has a future? When was the last time any of you were in a mall? I'm trying to think. Somebody might have dragged me to one at one point in time. Well, I mean, people don't go to brick and mortar stores and they definitely don't buy their games in physical form anymore. They download it. GameStop basic business model started melting down five, six, seven years ago, and it's been in trouble for a long time. Its revenues have been shrinking. It's, it's lost money for the last four years or last five years. So along the way, it became one of the most highly shorted stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Somebody tell me what, 
what shorting is and what it, why exactly it became the shorted stock. What are those shorting investors who shorted hoping will happen? Yes. They're hoping that the stock plummets and that they the pay stock pay. will go to zero. Basically, they were betting that there would be the business model would melt down. So the start of 2021, it looked like it was in a pathway to zero. Stock was down to $14 or $15, maybe even lower. When something almost magical happened. A group of people gathered together on Reddit. Now, first, you know, we live in the 21st century. They gathered together on CNBC. They got gathered on Reddit. And they decided that they were going to buy GameStop. I quoted, I wrote a post then calling it the, you know, you know what a short squeeze is? In the old days when people shorted stocks, Andrew Carnegie, for instance, one of his... Um, opponents tried to short one of his companies. And he decided that he was going to destroy this guy. You don't become a billionaire by being compassionate. And you know how he did it, right? He went and bought every share that was out in the market. And when you sell short, what you've done is you borrowed somebody else's shares, agreeing to buy it and return it. So he buys every share in the market. So all these people have shorted their shares go to cover their short, which means to buy the shares, and there's no shares out there. And Andrew Carnegie says, I have all the shares. I'll sell them to you, but at a, at a different price. That's a short squeeze. He bankrupted the guy. But the old short squeeze is one rich guy squeezing another rich guy. It's usually just a guy. It wasn't, there weren't rich women you know, playing this game, but today it could be anyone, one rich person and another rich person. In this case, it wasn't a rich person. This was a crowd of people, but with enough people in that crowd, you could buy the shares, and, and that's exactly what they did. You know what the price of GameStop rose to over the next few weeks? $400 per share. So I went to the Reddit site because I wanted to see what the motivation was. Maybe they had a story of the return of GameStop, they had a business model with. So I read post after post, and there's a single theme that comes through. You know why they were doing it? What is the motivation? They wanted to get revenge on the hedge funds. Why? I mean, remember many, many of these people, and this is part of what's called the mean stock thing, where in their 20s, they're big student loans, they're convinced that the hedge funds convince them to get that degree in whatever college and you know, whatever reason they're and so it's revenge is saying. It's not rational. It is the most rational thing you can think of, right? When you have a neighbor you don't like, are you thinking rational thoughts or irrational thoughts? I mean, as human beings, irrational thoughts out overwhelm rational thoughts. It demands supply. In finance, we've known about this for 50 years. We call it behavioral finance. In fact, there are at least four Nobel Prize winners who come out of that area. Behavioral finance basically says that there are human emotions that can cause the price to be differing from value. So let me be very clear. Behavioral finance doesn't change the value one cent. It's not about value. It's about the pricing mechanism and why price can be different from that. So what? If I ask you to price a company, you see what you need to factor in? You need to factor in the mood, the momentum, all those forces going in. You're saying, how am I going to do that? I know we dismiss technical analysis and charts, but have you ever seen chartists and what they do? They draw the chart of the price and they tell you a story. There's a head and a shoulder and a resistance line and a support line. I know your, your head's starting to spin, but essentially underlying all of charting is the hope that the chart will give you an earlier signal of mood shifts and momentum shifts. If you're asked to price something, you're probably, you're, your better tool is probably a technical analysis or a charting than a discounted cash flow valuation. But if you really want to price a company then, you know what you do? You look for other companies just like yours and you look at what other people are paying for those companies and you decide how much you see. That is so unsophisticated. Do any of you own your own apartments or houses? Technically, you own it. You have a loan, I'm sure, right, on the side, but technically, you own it. Let me ask you a question, Manish. When you went to look at your house, a realtor probably showed you the house, did you do a discounted cash flow evaluation of the house? No, okay. How did you decide what to pay? Just on the mood and the basic 
But that, that's a different thing, right? But, but the realtor gave you a number, right? How did the realtor come up with that number? He looked at the surrounding houses. And Basically, he looked at this next, the, the six blocks around. He looked at houses like yours. And then you adjusted for difference. You have an extra bedroom. Your backyard is a little bigger. All of real estate is pricing, not just a house. Real estate is built on pricing. You see? So what? That pricing can deviate entirely from value. Nothing you can do about it, at least for the moment. But if you're asked to price something, you're looking for other things like it and what people are paying. In the context of stocks, this gets tricky, right? Why? Because the share price is a little arbitrary. Arbitrary in what sense? If I do a two for one stock split, what happens to my share price roughly, right? After I do the split? It goes in half. It's not, but it's getting more, just more units. You can't compare share prices across companies because otherwise Berkshire Hathaway is always going to look expensive and penny stocks are going to look cheap, right? Do you know what you do? You divide the price by something, by earnings, by book value. And what do you get? You get a multiple. Whenever people use multiples and comparables, they should not use the word value for what they've done, even though they do it all the time. They've priced the company. Nothing wrong with that. And I think we can do pricing better. But I, I'll draw that contrast. And as we go through the class, talk about when we're doing each one and why the numbers can be different. Third, what are we going to try to value in this class? Pretty much everything. Now, obviously, we'll spend a lot of time with publicly traded companies, not because it's my preferred domain, but because the data is there. But we're going to talk about value private businesses. We're going to value individual assets. We're going to talk about some of the parts valuation. We're going to talk about the value of, you know, Taylor Swift to the NFL or the value of you. Basically, we're valuing everything and we're going to look at it through multiple lens as an investor, as a manager, as, a, as a, somebody taking over the company. Here's my hope of what you will get out of the class. By the end of this class, I hope you can value just about anything. Okay. You have the tools. I mean, all you need to do is bring an imagination and bring, be creative. You should be able to value just about anything. So now let me go back to the story number connection. Here's the way I describe a good valuation. A good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. What the heck does that even mean? When I show you my valuation of Tesla, you can get caught up in the little details about cost of capital. But tomorrow when you see my valuation of the week, you, you know what you're gonna see as my revenue in year 10? $700 billion and your eyes should pop out right away. Why? How many companies in the world have revenues of 700 billion right now? The answer is zero. Amazon, Walmart are getting close and maybe they'll... So I'm giving the company immense revenues. And he, here's the second problem. What's the, what are the largest automobile companies in terms of revenues in the world right now? It's yeah. Volkswagen and Toyota, roughly 300 billion in revenues. I'm making Tesla two and a half times bigger. So here's the question you need to ask. What is the story you're telling about Tesla? Because I can't hide behind, I used to 50% growth rate, that tells you absolutely nothing. Because that story has got to be a special one, right? In my story, I see Tesla become the largest automobile company in the world. That'll give them 500 billion in revenues. You're saying, where's the extra 200 billion coming from? I see Tesla opening up other business. Part of it is the energy business that they're already in getting bigger but also a software business and potentially a ride-sharing business. You see, what software business? Anybody here own a Tesla? You own a Tesla? Do you have software on your car that you got to update? What happens if you, if you don't have the software? What happens to your car? Then you know, all, all your systems are not functioning. Right? So basically your car becomes a hump, hunk of metal sitting in the garage waiting for the software update. Is it conceivable? Right now, the software comes bundled with the car. Could you see a world where at least some aspect of the software, like especially with FSD, there's a talk of making it additional software that you pay for. You might not pay for it, but some Tesla owners might say, I want that. That's the software business. It's not going to give them huge revenues, 
but it's a very high margin business. Its margins are five, six, seven times higher marginal automobile business. In my story, Tesla becomes the largest automobile company in the world with an energy and a software business and potentially even an opening to being a ride sharing business. Why it comes right out of the F, uh, because what's the biggest cost a current ride sharing company like Uber or Lyft faces? What happens when you pay the fare in Uber? Where does 80% of the fare go? Drivers. It goes to the drivers, right? Imagine a world where you own the cars and there are no drivers. Don't imagine it too much because that's, there's all kinds of side costs that have to be created because if a lot of cars are like that, then you'd be selling fewer cars and your parking lots are going to go to dust because, I mean, there's a whole host of side costs. But in my story, that's what's driving my revenues, my margins. When I talk about valuation being a bridge between stories and numbers, every number in your valuation has to have a story behind it. And every story you tell me about the company has to have a number that goes with it, right? So if you tell me your company is great management, I'm not just going to let you walk away. I'm going to say great in what sense? What do they do that makes them great? Okay. I think NVIDIA is great management. You know what I based it on? What's NVIDIA's current value coming from? The AI business, right? Why are they so dominant in the AI business? Because they started three years ahead of everybody else. Before the AI business, we had the crypto business and NVIDIA was there a couple of years before everybody else. Before the crypto business, there was a gaming business. NVIDIA was there. You do it once, you could, you could argue it's luck, right? You do it three times as something systematically in the company that allows them to get ahead of their competition. It became part of my NVIDIA story when I valued NVIDIA. Great between stories and numbers. And here's why I think the story people have an advantage. By the, you know, by the end of this class, if you're a numbers person or a story person, here's my hope. If you're a story person, I hope you get comfortable enough with numbers that you become a disciplined storyteller. Because if you're a storyteller and you have no restraints, think of the typical strategist. These are storytellers with no restraints, no guardrails. You tell fairy tales, right? I hope you become a disciplined storyteller. And if you're a number cruncher, by the end of this class, I hope you trust your imagination enough to let it fly. Because you spent an entire lifetime bludgeoning that poor thing into the ground, right? Because the word subjective is weakness. You can't tell a story, give me an equation. You're fighting a lifetime of being told that storytelling is pricey, <clears throat> it's subjective. And you're right. Every single semester, you're right when, I, when you said storytellers have an advantage, and here's why. Every single semester, I run this experiment through, trying to make storytellers develop discipline and number crunches, let loose their imagination. Every single semester, I have more trouble with number crunches than storytellers. You give me a hundred history majors, I can teach them enough valuation, value companies tomorrow. You give me a hundred engineers, I'm completely and totally screwed. <laughs> so those of you number friends, as I want you to be aware of this because you're looking for closure. You want correctness. When you get an answer, what do you want? Is this correct? It's built into you. And you gotta let that go because you're always going to be wrong and it's okay. And that takes a while to stick, but you got to work through that discomfort of knowing that you don't know what the right answer is, that you don't know whether you've done things wrong, and nobody does. I'd love to tell you that I always told stories in evaluation. When I first started teaching valuation, though, I taught it like a number crunch a day. What does that mean? When in doubt, I put up an equation. If I was still doubtful, I put up a second equation. Still doubtful, I made them simultaneous equations because it gave me a sense of being in control. And about six years into teaching this class, I knew I had a problem. And here's what the problem was. I could value just about any asset you gave me, but I had no faith. Strange word to use in evaluation class, right? 
Here's what I mean by no faith. I mean, you value something. I mean, I don't value for a living. I don't work for an appraisal company. I don't value consulting. I value for one reason and one reason. No, I value Tesla because I want to be able to act on the valuation. What does that require? If I find Tesla to be undervalued, I have to be willing to buy. And I was unwilling to do it because I knew how easily I could move value. It's just numbers. 30% growth rate doesn't work. Try 40%. And I knew that what was missing was a story that held my numbers together. So 1992, 93, I started trying to tell stories about my valuation. And the first time I did it was like the first time I scrambled eggs. It's painful. But here's the good news. Today, I'm still a number cruncher, but I feel pretty comfortable telling stories. I can spin bullshit with the best of them. Okay? You can put me in a room full of VCs. I can tell stories with them, but I also have the benefit of knowing what the numbers tell me. So my point is, don't expect this to come easily. You'll have to work at it. But working on your weak side is what this class should be about. It's not reinforcing your strong side. Because here's where the faith comes in. To act on evaluation, you have to have faith in your own valuation of the company. So I told you I got a value 192 for Tesla. I have to have faith in that value. Why is that difficult? Because I know it could be wrong. And what's the other thing I have to have faith in? The stock I think is right now at 182. I've got to have faith the 182 will become 192. The price will adjust back. You know why we use the word faith? How many of you are religious? Okay. I'm not, but I go with my wife to church every Sunday. I'm not Catholic, but for 40 years, I know when to kneel, when to get up. You know, I, I have the whole thing nailed down. Okay? And then they do the water. I make sure my head is in the way, so I get the water on my head. So I, I've got this thing, I think. Okay? But if you're religious and you go to your religious authority and you say, you know, father, rabbi, whatever, you know, it's say, no, I'm, I'm working really hard to be good and a lot of sacrifice. Can you give me some proof that God exists? Because it seems like a lot of work. What will you get as an answer, at least if your religious authorities is, is an honest, straightforward person? I can't prove it. You have to have faith. The essence of faith is you cannot prove it. In the context of evaluation, if you come to me and say, can you prove to me that your evaluation is right? I can't, I can't even prove it to myself. I just have faith. You say, can you prove to me that if I get a value that's right and the price is different, the price will adjust the value? My answer is exactly the same. I hope it will. But I can't prove it. Now, the essence of faith also is that it will be tested. You know how it will be tested. I'm planning. I'm In fact, I had limit buy in Tesla that kicked in yesterday. I'm now a proud Tesla shareholder. At 182. Tomorrow, let's say the stock goes to 170. Good, right? You know what that is? The market knocking on your door saying, do you still have faith? Yes, yes. Drops to 160. Market's knocking even louder. Do you still have faith? Every time the market moves against you, it's a test of your faith. And I've, I've never been shy about admitting that my faith gets tested. And I actually have a lot of skepticism for people who claim their faith is absolute. Like who? Like all those people who show up in Omaha, Nebraska every year for what I call value investing Woodstock, right? Berkshire Hathaway meetings. They're true believers. They think they are the chosen ones. They've read security analysis. They've read every Warren Buffett letter sent out. Their faith is absolute. Which makes no sense to me. When you say your faith is absolute, that's not faith, that's dogma. The accepting that you can be wrong and you might have to change your mind is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. I remember the 1970s, my mother took me to see Mother Teresa at that time when I was living in India. And I still remember during the talk, Mother Teresa said, every morning I wake up and I question the existence of God. And I said, Mother Teresa can get up every morning and question the existence of God. I can get up every morning and say, did I get my Tesla valuation right? right? <laughs> I mean, this notion that this is somehow absolute is, I think, the opposite of what you should be doing. Is keep an open mind. Accept the fact that you'd be wrong. Have some faith. Because if no faith, you're just going to give up. 
but I can't endow that to you. It's something that has to come from within. So in terms of the class itself, this session and the next, we'll lay out the big picture. So our next class, I'm gonna look at different ways of approaching valuation. Then we're gonna spend about nine sessions essentially visiting the inputs into intrinsic value, discount rates, cash flows. But some of you, this will be boring because you have seen that before. I know what a bait is. I know what a risk free rate is. There's, even if you do, there's no harm reinforcing it. And some of you are going to be surprised at what you think you know might not be the right way to do it. During this period, you're going to get very impatient because I'm not going to, I'll be taking value pieces of companies, Airbnb's growth rate. No. Embraer's cost of capital. There won't be a single company I'm valuing all the way through. But if you have patience, sessions 12 through 15, I'm going to essentially just value company after company. And I'm going to do it on the dark side. It's difficult to value companies. Then section 16 to 19, I'm going to talk about doing pricing better. Because I think people not only price, they do it in a very sloppy way. They act like it's 1965. You have no access to data. You can compute any statistics. We live in a world where we have data and statistics. We should be able to do pricing better. Session 20, I'm going to talk about valuing private companies. Privately owned companies. You have a small business, that hot dog stand outside. You say, can you give me a value? And then in session 21 through 23, I'm going to talk about bringing in insights from option pricing in the context of valuing companies. Young pharma companies, natural resource companies, distress, equity and distress companies. Session 24, I'm going to spend on acquisition valuation. This is only one session. I was once asked to teach an M&A class by Stern. And I said, look, I can teach the class, but I run out of material after about 45 minutes. I've never understood what the big deal about acquisition valuation is. You value a target company. Of course, two magical words float around, control and synergy. So much of what I'll do in the acquisition valuation is how do you value control? How do you value synergy? What does that even mean? Session 25, I'm going to talk about changing the value. For the first 24 sessions, we're going to be a little passive. We're going to be looking at companies and saying, I'm going to value that company. In session 25, I'm going to bring you on the inside. Say, so you're running the company now. How would you increase the value, change the value of a company? So for those of you who end up working in businesses, building your own business, this will take the tools of valuation, which you think about as valuing companies, and use them to say, how do I run the company to increase its value? And session 26 is the grand finale, which is basically taking what you've done in the class and trying to look at how does it play out. Now the preseason prep, it's too late for maybe not. You can still do it this weekend, but if your accounting is a little shaky, your statistics is you've got amnesia, <laughs> and your foundations class, even though you did it just last year, not that they're like. Turkish construction foundations. Actually, after an earthquake, you very quickly discovered there's no foundation there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, there I have these mini versions of these classes that I've created. It's not because I don't trust the people teaching this. Class. Actually, it's because I don't trust the people teaching these classes. So they're quite honest. This is these are very idiosyncratic views of this is what I need in my valuation class. Each class is, is about 12 sessions, three hours. So a good way to kind of, you know catch up if you feel weak. As in my corporate finance class, and for those of you in my corporate finance class, the harassment will continue. Mm -hmm. no, the beatings will continue until morale improves, as they say, the mailings in the states will continue. Every day for the next 15 weeks, barring the spring break, you will hear from me. Today's class, I'll tell you about the class. Tomorrow will be the valuation of the week. So you'll get the Tesla valuation Wednesday. You'll hear about the class and I'll send what's called a weekly chant, which is something that takes the topics for that week and says, can you build on it? Can you try it on this? On Thursday, I will nag you about your project. You're saying, what project? More about them in a few minutes. Okay. Essentially saying, this is where you should be. This is where you are. <clears throat> what's keeping you? Okay. On Friday, I'll send out what's called a web, basically a webcast and something in valuation, getting your hands dirty. So when we talk about estimating beta, I'll talk about how I got the beta from Capital IQ. So it's really about getting your hands dirty about from getting data. On Saturday, you'll get a newsletter. Not much news, but basically saying, this is where we are in the class. This is where we're going. And on Sunday, I will lay out what's coming in the next week and send you a solution to the weekly challenge. 
me be very clear. The weekly challenges, again, are up to you. You can try them. You cannot try them. You think, should I, if I do them, will my grade improve? I have no idea. That's not what they're there for. But they're really about building what you learn in this class and push, pushing them to the next step. In terms of class material, the one thing that, um, you know, that you need for this class are the lecture notes. The lecture notes, all three packets are now up. There are about 750 slides, which means it's probably best that you don't print them and kill all those rainforests in Brazil in the process. So you can keep them digital. I mean, we get a really big iPad, it'll really help. But you no, know, keep it digitally. Every every slide you see in this class will be in those packets. You no, know, and I would really, really, really like you to be in class. But I am a realist. There will be times you have to miss a class. The classes I'm I've set up on Zoom. Every class, so if you have to miss a class, it'll be live on Zoom. It'll be recorded on Zoom. It'll also be available as a YouTube video. So basically, there's no reason for missing the class. Right? So catch up if you don't. I have five books on valuation. You don't need any of them. Okay? If you want to buy it, I have a little descriptive of what may set them apart. So you know, some are obscenely overpriced, some are cheaper. You know, some you can get in Indian editions for even cheaper. I shouldn't be saying this, but as, you know, my publishers won't like it, but I don't care where you get it or if you get it. So Get it if you need it, but you will not need it for this class. But you know, incidentally, if you have an Apple device, an iPhone or an iPad, a friend of mine, Anand Sundaram at Dartmouth and I developed an app that does intrinsic valuation. It's the ultimate key cap, which has been an airport stuck on a late flight rather than doing what normal people do, which I think is get drunk. You sit there valuing a company on your own. Try it out. So, you know, if nothing else, people will step away from you, give you a lot of distance, you know, strange person, valuing a company in the middle of nowhere. If you have an Android, forget about it. I, mean, I'm not going to go that I know there's a bright space page for this class. I visited it last week. I put the basic stuff on. I'm not visiting it again for the next 15 weeks. Almost everything in this class is going to be transacted through my web, the web page for the class, which you've got in the email, so check it out. Um, the YouTube video will have all of the lectures as just a set of, you know, and every email I send this class, I will collect in a chronicle so you can see the email history for the entire class. Google Calendar tells you when the quizzes are, so check it out to make sure that you can, uh, that, you, that you will be able to be here. Now, and I'll talk about what will happen if you have to miss a quiz, which some of you will. Now, my blog, I already said to you my first four blog posts on data updates for this year. About once every two or three weeks, I will write on something. I have no idea what the next thing is going to be, but I'm, I'm a dabbler. I move on from topic to topic. So last year when I was teaching this class in February, while I was teaching the class, this report came out that a group called the Hindenburg Group had targeted an Indian company called Adani. I know nothing about Adani. I know even less about the Hindenburg Group, but the story struck me as an interesting valuation story. So I valued it, I posted on it. So my guess is there'll be interesting things that happen over the next four months. Um, and they will be grist for the mill. So I have a Twitter feed, but my tweets are very, very rare. And basically they're about directing you somewhere else because you know, the reason Twitter exists is for the same reason we all stop on a highway to see an accident, right? It's, it's because bad things happen on Twitter when people engage. So I will engage with no one on Twitter. So basically I'll tweet and I'm gone. And other readings if you have time. So ultimately though, if you're thinking about grading on the class, my objective is to make sure you can value things. If you can value just about everything, you deserve an A. If you, value, if you can value most things, B, B plus. If you can value some things, which is kind of a minimum, if you can value nothing at the end of this class, then I've really done a bad job and you've got nothing out of the class. So the entire class is structured around making that divide. So here's what's going to drive your grade. First, there will be a project where you pick a company and value it over the course of the entire semester. You'll have to do it as part of a group simply because partly for logistical reasons and partly because I want you to know that there will be group members who will have trouble that you have to pull up. Some, you learn valuation by trying to explain to other people what something is. 
and it's good to have to do that, especially the, and it might be different thing, different parts of the project. That valuation project is due at the end of the semester, but especially in the spring, we have this strange phenomenon called premature graduation. And especially if you're a second year, you know what that is? Around March, mentally you've left the school already, mm -hmm. right? And it's very difficult to extract anything from you at that point. So to kind of counter that, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. One of the things in your valuation is an intrinsic valuation of your company, a TCF valuation. Halfway through the semester, I'm going to ask you to submit that, not for a grade, but for feedback. It's completely optional, like much of the class. So around March 20, the, uh, uh, around March 29th, it's so a Friday. If you send me that valuation, I'll take a look at your valuation. I won't give you a grade, but I'll say, you know, your growth rate, you might want to rethink this number, your discount rate, you might have missed this part of it. So it's essentially about getting feedback. But the entire project is due on the last day of class by 5 p.m. Now, in terms of quizzes, there will be three quizzes. Uh, for the, that first date is obviously wrong. That should be February 28th, not April 28th. February 28th, April 1st, and April 22nd. Each is worth 10% open book, open notes. And a final exam, which will be on May 8th. And I think this time schedule for it is 1.30 to 3.30. That'll be 30%. Open book, open notes. Every quiz and exam I've given an evaluation class is online on that page for the class. So you can't complain you didn't get enough practice. You'll have to pick and choose how many you can work through. My suggestion is you have limited time, start with the latest quizzes and work backwards. But that's going to be it. Now I know some of you will have to miss a quiz. If you do, here's what's going to happen. That 10% will be moved to what's left in the class, in, in, in exams in the class. So you miss the, let's say you take the first quiz, that's a 10%. You've missed the second quiz. I'll take the 10% and move it into your third quiz and your final. You miss the third quiz, it'll all go into the final. Why? Because that's to prevent what I call strategic quiz missing, right? Which is if you do really well on the first two quizzes, you're going to be tempted to miss the third quiz. This way, it's always going to get pushed out to what's left. What's a good reason to miss a quiz? I'll be quite honest. I'm not going to ask for doctor's notes. I'm going to trust you when you say I couldn't make it. Okay. But remember, if you do miss a quiz, there is a cost. And the cost is if you take all three quizzes, I will take the worst quiz you, you had and move the score on that quiz to the average score and everything else. So you get 0, 10, 10, 30, which means you got perfect scores on three and nothing. I'll move the 0 to a 10. So it's available only if you take all quizzes. So there is an incentive to take all the quizzes, even if you don't feel ready. There's nothing you will gain by missing a quiz, right? So if, you, if you're here, might as well take the quiz. In terms of rules of engagement, pick your own groups. I will not assign you a group. You're saying, what if I cannot find a group? Towards the end of this week, I will create what's called an orphan list. <laughs> And I will invite orphans to join us. I will list you there. And I will put a pathetic story of these poor people who need to be adopted. So try, I mean, if you get into a group, you don't, but if you don't get into a group, let me know. I'll put you on the orphan list and you will get adopted. Right? Yeah. And needless to say, the quizzes and exams are individual work. They're graded on it. And I don't give grades for participation, but I'd love more participation from a purely selfish perspective, which is, the more you talk, the less I have to talk, right? <laughs> and that makes my life easier. So, and because this is the first time I've taught in this room in 22 years, I've been teaching Paulson. I begged them to give me this room and they gave me the class numbers because this is a good room to talk. Unlike Paulson, we can't even see people. So I know you've got your nameplates, try to bring your nameplates. I won't, if I call on you, it's not because I want to embarrass you. I want to draw you into the discussion. If you don't feel comfortable in that discussion, just pass. It's not the end of the world, right? So I've asked you, what do you think of Tesla? And you say, I don't want to answer that question because I have deep thoughts about Elon Musk. I let it go and I move on to the next person, right? So if you can bring your name plates and you have them, bring it in. Otherwise, just get a piece of cardboard, put your name in. But I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>